<clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So, uh, hi, everybody. I think most of you know me. Or I think all of you know me. I'm Kevin. I uh, defended uh, with Dr. Dowell this February, so um, just kind of sitting tight until I moved to my job in uh, the Air Force Research Lab in Ohio. So today I will be talking about some work that Max and I have been doing. Um, I guess Max will be talking about his work. I'll be talking about my work um, on supersonic and hypersonic computational air elasticity. Um, okay, so today we'll talk a little bit, start off with the structural side of things. So we'll talk about um, how we can use the inextensible beam and plate model for uh, things like free free beams and for cantilever beams and plates. Um, so that's uh, anything that doesn't have uh, fully clamped boundary conditions. Um, you're going to want to use an inextensible model rather than what Max is going to be talking about where he has a plate model with in-plane boundary conditions um, that are different than, than a free boundary condition. Um, and then we will talk about the uh, supersonic and hypersonic fluid structure interaction with that model. So we'll talk about the limit cycle oscillation on a cantilevered plate using piston theory aerodynamics. And then Max will get into um, his work, which is supersonic, uh, hypersonic FSI on a plate with in-plane boundary conditions. And he'll show you how you can kind of vary the boundary conditions with his model, which is pretty cool. His model also has uh, static deformation from aerodynamic heating, um, which is which is interesting. So with these models, you're going to get a lot of heat in the hypersonic range, um, which matters a lot if you are supported on all edges because you can buckle the plate. It doesn't matter as much with something like a cantilever beam, like I'm going to show you, um, because you don't get buckling. So mine doesn't have any thermal effects, but Max's does. And I think if he has time, he'll talk about um, some new work that he's done, which is transient responses, uh, which correlate with uh, starting up a wind tunnel. So at the wind tunnel start, you get a lot of transients. I'm not sure if he's going to have time for that, though. Um, so we get started on my stuff, which is the inextensible beam model and plate model. <clears throat> All right, so we have this beam. Can you guys see my cursor or not? Uh, where is your cursor right now? I don't see one. It's probably because I'm in presenter view. Um, let me let me get out of presenter view so that I can. I think if I have that, how do I do that now? Uh, if you go back down to the to the dot dot dot, that should allow you to move back over. Hide presenter, Hide presenter view. view. Yep. We definitely don't okay. see your cursor though. Okay. Now do you? Yes. Okay. Let me just do this then. Um, and I'll just keep track of time on my watch, which is slow. So this will be great. Going great. Um, okay, so we have this beam model here, right? And uh, <clears throat> we want to calculate the, the motion of this model. And so this is a cantilevered beam. Obviously, you have a fixed end at the left end and a free end at the right. Um, normally, what we do with these models is we just calculate the out-of-plane displacement, which is uh, written here as W. But because there's uh, no support on the left end, the whole thing is free to move also in the in-plane direction, which we call U. And we're going to couple the U and the W equations um, with what we call the inextensibility condition. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a second. But that's what I mean when I, when I say inextensible. It just means that this, uh, this beam cannot elongate along its arc length. So the arc length is always constant. And the way we're going to set up these equations is we're going to solve the Lagrange's equations. So you guys should have seen this in this class. Um, Lagrange's equations just written here. Um, <clears throat> Lagrangian for this problem is going to be what it normally is, which is the kinetic energy T minus potential energy V. But we're going to include this Lagrange multiplier integral. And that is what enforces the inextensibility constraint. That's, that's what enforces the um, that the arc length is always constant. Okay, um, the kinetic energy looks like it normally looks. Um, so what I mean by that is it's just the integral of one half mv squared. So for the velocity, if you have the velocity in u and the velocity in w. The potential energy um, up to the first term looks like it normally would for the Euler-Bernoulli beam equation. Uh, so we have curvature squared and then uh, you integrate that 
with the flexural rigidity. And this now is going to be an expansion to the second power in dw dx squared. Um, and that, that, what that is doing is that is naturally including that inextensibility um, and some of these assumptions we're making about how large this, this beam is, how, how large these deflections are. We're going to put that right into the potential energy. That gives us a fourth order um, nonlinearity in, in this in W. So that's going to give us a stiffness nonlinearity. Um, <clears throat> so then we're going to couple U and W through this constraint. Uh, this constraint is from an old text from Novogilov, where he said that if the arc length has to remain constant, then there's this relationship between the slope in U and the slope in W. So, um, so that's kind of the setup of the problem. What we're going to do is we're going to expand each coordinate modally. So the U and the W displacements are going to be expanded into mode shapes and modal coordinates in time. And then also the Lagrange multiplier lambda, that is going to be, you can interpret that as the internal force required to keep the arc length constant. And that is also going to be separated into, uh, into X and T parts. So this is just, I think you guys learned about this in this class, it's just a separation of variables technique. When you do all of that, um, you put the modal equations into the potential kinetic energy and the Lagrange multiplier, you put those terms into the Lagrange's equations, you end up with three equations of motion. Um, the top one is the U equation, so the longitudinal or in-plane equation. Uh, the middle equation is the W equation, so this is going to be what you normally see um, for, for these kinds of problems, where the W or out-of-plane displacement is what you're really looking for. And you can see this red underline here shows the simple uh, spring mass damper equation. So you have linear inertia, linear damping, and linear stiffness. And then we have this BW lambda term, which couples in the constraint equation uh, from U and W, and that gives you a nonlinear inertia term. And PW cubed gives you a nonlinear stiffness term. So in, this in these sets of equations, we have two nonlinearities. We have an inertia and we have a stiffness. And all of these bold uh, letters are modal matrices. So, so things like this, where you have the integral of the mode shape squared um, in, in W is gonna give you the mass distribution in W. We're going to set that to be ortho normal. Uh, so you guys have seen how to do that in Dr. Kielb's vibrations class, um, where you just set the mass matrix to be identi the identity matrix based on your choice of these, uh, these mode shapes. These equations work for uh, either cantilevered or free free boundary conditions, which is a pretty good, uh, it's a, a pretty good way to to model equations where these equations work for these systems, all you have to do to change from boundary condition to boundary condition is change these modal matrices. Okay, so just as an example, um, if I were to have this beam and I were to be pushing on it with a non-conservative follower force, um, these are some responses that you'd see. What I mean by non-conservative follower force is I mean I'm going to be pushing on this beam tip uh, with a constant force, but it, the force is going to always be parallel to the angle that this beam is making. And so what that does is that simulates a, a non-conservative force just like a, an aerodynamic force is a non-conservative force. And if you push on that uh, below some critical force, the system just decays to zero from its uh, initial conditions. And if you push on it with a force that's above the critical force, um, you get some transient startup, and then eventually this settles into a uh, just a, a harmonic oscillation, uh, which we call the limit cycle oscillation. And the um, the amplitude of this limit cycle oscillation is going to be dependent on how strong your nonlinear stiffness is. So if we didn't have that nonlinear stiffness in here, this would just uh, this would just go to flutter, and it would just go to infinity. Uh, but because we have a nonlinearity in there, uh, this, this results in a, a pretty stable limit cycle oscillation. Um, okay. We can do the same exact thing with the plate model. I'm not going to go into details on this, just to show you kind of how to do that with the plate. 
Now we have two constraints rather than just one. So we have one in the X and in the Y direction. We have the same kinetic energy, but now we have this, uh, this uh, velocity in V as well as U and W. The potential energy is a lot more complicated because now we have uh, the potential energy in both X and Y, and then we have to couple those through Poisson's ratio. Um, so, so that's a little bit more tricky. And then of course we have two constraints instead of one because we're working in three dimensions instead of two. So um, the plate model, you know, just really quickly, it's now five equations of motion instead of the, the three that we had before. And um, you can see that we have the linear uh, inertia, linear stiffness, we have nonlinear stiffness, and now we have two nonlinear inertia terms, uh, one in U and one in V. So just to give you an idea of what that kind of looks like, I'm not sure if the videos, how are the videos coming through, are they okay? They're okay. We're probably getting five frames per second, but we can see the dynamics well enough. Okay, cool. Um, so the plate motion, just to show you, like um, with these simple equations, you can get something that looks, you know, that's that's pretty well modeled as far as the physics physics go. Um, we are working on improving this model to match experiments like throughout really large ranges of motion right now. Right now, this is pretty good for small ranges of motion, and then. Um, there's a lot more math to come uh, of that. But so that's kind of how we build these structural models. We start with the Lagrange's equations. Uh, we take into consideration the boundary conditions we're working with and what constraints um, and what assumptions we can make based on that. So in this case, we made the inextensible uh, assumptions and we built constraints around that and, and we built these models this way. Um, Okay, so that was just kind of a quick overview. Where am I on time? Oh, I'm doing great. Um, <clears throat> so now we'll talk about the adding piston theory aerodynamics to these models. So we'll talk about um, we'll talk about adding piston theory to a cantilevered plate. Uh, I, I should say that it's really the beam model, and we're just assuming that the beam has a constant uh, constant width, and that there's no rotation um, or, or torsion on that plate so that we can just assume that it has a beam-like response. Uh, before I go into adding, uh, I guess we'll just start with the start with the aerodynamics. So you guys have seen piston theory in this class, I believe. Um, so the pressure on one side of the surface, which we'll start with the upper side, uh, can be modeled as the air density plus the or times the uh, speed of the air moving over the wing over the Mach number times this downwash term. So this is the speed of the airfoil uh, in the W direction plus the speed of the airflow times the slope of the airfoil. So you guys have seen this in the class kind of a lot, I believe. This is coming from a uh, Taylor expansion of simple wave theory. So you can expand this out to third order. And this is done kind of, this is the classic uh, literature on piston theory is if you take simple wave theory and do a Taylor expansion, all three of these terms can be considered uh, important for some cases. If we have this, uh, this beam in flow such that there's flow on both the upper and the lower surface, so think of um, like the trailing edge of the trailing edge control surface of a wing, you can have flow over both the upper and the lower surfaces. Um, we can model the pressure on the lower surface the same as we did on the upper surface, but now the sign on the downwash terms is going to be opposite. To get the total pressure difference across the wing, um, we just subtract the two. And you can see that because of that sign difference in the lower uh, surface, the second order terms cancel. So we're left with a first order piston theory plus a third order piston theory for this case. Uh, to tell if you need first order or if you need to go to the, uh, the higher expansion of third order, you just compare the size of these terms. So if your downwash squared is small compared to one, then you can just use first order piston theory. If your downwash squared is on the order of one or non-negligible, um, you need to keep it in there. But we'll look at first order piston theory for now. So the first step we took when we did this, uh, this problem was just first order piston theory, keep it simple, um, nice and easy. 
the way to include piston theory into these models is to use a principle of virtual work. So we integrate um, the pressure times the width of the beam, so that B is the width in uh, out of the screen. And we're going to add that to the uh, del W component of these equations, which means that we're adding it only in the vertical uh, direction for now. We're going to integrate that across the entire length of this beam. Uh, all right, so I said that. Okay, so what that does is on the left-hand side of these equations is the structural part. On the right-hand side, we're going to have the aerodynamics. So this results in an aerodynamic damping, which is denoted by that time derivative over W, and also an aerodynamic stiffness, which is denoted by uh, no derivatives here. So you know this looks like this, and this equation, or this term looks like this equation. So um, the lambda and the mu are the uh, the important non-dimensional parameters here. So let mu, uh, mu is going to be the air to structural mass. So the mass of the air um, per the mass of the structure with a factor of Mach number in there. Um, the air to structural force is the lambda. So this is what's going to be uh, important when we're talking about the air speed. So this is going to be how much force is the air putting on the uh, plate. So we have the density of the air times the speed of the air over the flexural rigidity of the plate. This is what's going to be uh, kind of our independent parameter for this, for this project. Um, so when we talk about increasing the airspeed or decreasing it, we're going to be changing this non-dimensional parameter lambda. OK. So when we do this, we would expect, uh, much like when we put the non-conservative force at the tip of the, the trailing edge, I would, I would call it, um, we got a nice bounded limit cycle because we had this strong third order structural nonlinearity. So now we're applying, a um, rather than a single point force, we're applying this aerodynamic force from piston theory. We would expect to have that same kind of uh, limit cycle oscillation, but as you can see, that does not happen. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see the video, but essentially what's happening is this thing is going just out of control. Um, it's not a physical response anymore. And we uh, collaborated with some mathematicians on this problem, and they do work in um, calculating the energies of these systems to show whether or not there are stable limit cycles. And their work has shown, uh, similar to ours, that there is no way to prove that this has a stable limit cycle. So we don't believe that that's physical. Uh, we believe that's just a mathematical problem we're having. So because what we did is we only applied the pressure in the vertical direction. And we know for a fact that that's not how pressure works. Pressure is always acting normal to the, the plate. So what we had to do is we changed the uh, direction of the pressure by introducing this term beta. Uh, this beta term is just going to be the angle of the plate at any position along the beam. And that's going to be a function of x. Um, and we're going to include some, uh, we're just going to expand this into u components and w components in order to keep the pressure normal always to that beam. We can write cosine and sine in terms of W and the, the slope of W, and that allows us to just incorporate um, these, these pressures into the equations without introducing another uh, variable beta. So we're actually just writing this in terms of W. So we do that again. Um, now we have additional terms in, we have one additional term in the U equation, which we didn't have before. So that's the uh, left-right direction. And we have an additional term in the W equation. Um, and you can see that these are going to be third order nonlinearities. So um, this is going to be a nonlinear aerodynamic stiffness term. And what that does is that allows us to have a nice stable limit cycle. Um, and even if you can't see the video moving so well, you can see that towards the end of these, uh, these times, there's, and there's a stable limit cycle happening. So that was great. Um, we think that's a much more physical result, something that we would really see in a wind tunnel experiment. We can do the same thing with third order piston theory. If we include up to third order 
Um, interestingly enough, what, what that does is it gives the, uh, the nonlinear the nonlinear aerodynamic stiffness term, it actually decreases that, um, which means that it has a destabilizing effect and it, uh, it tracks with Mach number squared. So as you go up in Mach number, third order piston theory is going to give larger and larger limit cycle oscillations than its corresponding first order piston theory would, which is interesting. So um, again, not super, you might not be able to see it super great, but on the left is first order piston theory, on the right is third. And first order, the limit cycle uh, deflection is somewhere around 7% of the beam length. And for the third order piston theory, it's somewhere around 12. So this is important because if you want to run a test in a, in a wind tunnel and you tell your experimentalist, uh, I think this thing is going to oscillate with deflections less than 10% of the beam length, and then it really oscillates more than 10%, you could break things in the wind tunnel, uh, and then you would probably get fired. So modeling these uh, kind of intelligently is, is very, uh, very important. And understanding how these uh, different parameters affect your model is, is also really important. So this model has four uh, significant nonlinearities. We have two, uh, two structural nonlinearities, inertia and stiffness. And then we added two fluid nonlinearities. So we used third order piston theory, which brings us obviously into you know, getting this W cubed. Uh, but we also added that the pressure always acts normal to the instantaneous position of the plate. Um, so what Max will show you after I talk a little bit more about this is that his stuff is all first order piston theory, and that's because he has different boundary conditions than I do, um, such that the deflections of his plate are much, much smaller, and you don't need to worry about third order piston theory or that beta effect. Okay, um, so the, the important thing here is that we want to look at how these different nonlinearities affect the system. And so, first we look at just the structural. Nonlinearities. We're running this with um, the fully nonlinear. Uh, this is actually a typo. This is fully nonlinear aerodynamics uh, with third order nonlinear piston theory. Um, so if we sweep across values of lambda, remember that lambda value is the uh, the air pressure to the um, to the flexural rigidity. So that's a measure of how fast we're pushing this wing through the air. Um, you can see uh, the limit cycles for a linear structure with this nonlinear uh, arrow is in yellow. So at our highest value, you get a, a tip deflection of about 6%. If you were to do this with the fully nonlinear structure, you get responses that are way up here at you know, more than double of the response. So again, this is me saying, if I'm an experimentalist and you tell me that you're going to get responses at 5% and you get responses at 12%, I'm going to be really mad. So it's important to understand um, what, what each term is doing. And you can see if we include certain terms but don't include others. So for example, if we include only the inertia term, that pushes the response way up. If we include only the stiffness term, that pushes the response way down. So with these models, you can see exactly how these different terms are affecting your system. Uh, we can do this again um, with changing everything. So this is, uh, each one of these has this nonlinear piston theory beta effect in it, which allows us to have a stable limit cycle, but everything else can be varied. So if we do everything else is linear other than that nonlinear beta effect, you get a response into this purple line down here. But if you include everything, uh, all of the nonlinearities, third order piston theory, you get a response way up here. So again, um, this model is super, super highly sensitive to to these different terms. We can also check the sensitivity to the physical parameters. So Mach number being the important one here. So um, if we're at a low Mach number, Mach 2, you get this blue curve. And then as you increase the Mach number, um, the deflections uh, increase per your lambda value. So we go all the way up to Mach 6. So you know, at a, at a Mach 6, of 67 point something, you get a response that's similar to Mach 2 at 71, 72. Um, so, so this is, it's really sensitive to this. 
The interesting thing here is that each of these uh, Mach numbers cut off at some point. That cutoff is where the model breaks down um, and we just get non-physical results. The results go to infinity, the code breaks, everything is awful. And there's a trend here, which is that the code always breaks at um, the exact same RMS tip deflection times Mach number. And that's when the RMS tip deflection times the Mach number is 0.5. That's interesting because the classical literature on piston theory says that piston theory is only good for a characteristic length times the Mach number is less than between 0.5 and 1. And so we're, we're matching that pretty dead on, which is, which is really exciting. So that's telling us that it's not the structural part of the model that's breaking down there. It's, prob it's more than likely the, uh, the arrow part of the model. Okay, the mass ratio for, for the mass ratios we tried doesn't really affect things. Um, as you increase the mass ratio, your flutter point will change. Um, so, you know, if you have more, if the air is heavier compared to your plate, your flutter point is going to go down and vice versa. I think I said that right. Uh, but for these cases, it, it doesn't um, seem to have much of a difference. Okay, so because we have so many different uh, different terms and variables that are the model is super sensitive to, how do we know that we are modeling things correctly? The way to do that is to go to a higher fidelity model or a semi or even a, even an experiment. Um, but so, so we're going to take the Euler equations and model the same system and see if these higher fidelity Euler equations uh, will give us similar results to the lower fidelity piston theory. What I mean by that is the piston theory is a, um, it has no memory effect, so it can't tell what the pressure is doing anywhere other than the point that you are integrating on right at that, at that instant. Um, so... Um, but, but the Euler simulations do. So the Euler equations can take into account all of this stuff out, way out here in the far field, and it, it's, it's uh, much more uh, higher fidelity than the piston theory. So we're going to prescribe the beam motion and then measure the pressure on the beam based on the Euler uh, equations. Uh, again, I, I'm sorry that the videos aren't coming through super cleanly, but um, if you can see it here, this is just a simulation of that beam oscillating with the uh, flow moving from left to right. And you can see, hopefully, that there's a shock wave um, being formed on the upper surface of the, on the surface of the panel that's moving into the flow. Uh, you're looking at pressure contours. So red is high pressure and light, or dark blue is low pressure. So the, the point I wanted to get across from this plot is that this, this flow field is super complex. Um, there's some expansion waves, there's some compression waves, there's stuff happening in the far field. Um, that piston theory is not gonna be able to capture. And so it's interesting when we compare the two that actually the third order piston theory and the Euler solutions are very, very similar across one period. So um, the first order piston theory, not so good, but the third order piston theory is very good. So that's encouraging to us that we are modeling things that are, you know, at least they line up with the Euler results. We would hope that if we went to um, an even higher fidelity simulation or, uh, or an experiment that they would line up as well. And this is just another comparison. So we compared the, um, the fluid work done on the plate by integrating the pressure times the shape of the plate um, at different times, so, or, or at different, I guess, across the beam length. Um, so you can see that the Euler results and the third order piston theory results line up really, really nicely, and the first order uh, a little bit less. So um, that is kind of the, the supersonic, hypersonic FSI that I've worked on um, with this cantilevered plate configuration. These cantilevered plate configurations, um, there's talk of doing these in, in wind tunnels. Um, in different areas. So I know NC State wants to do a cantilevered configuration. Um, I think before we do that, we would have to really make sure that we don't break anything in the wind tunnel. So making sure that we validate our model and understanding if third order or first order piston theory is more correct, uh, things like that. I think the way, um, the way to do that is just to really inch up to that flutter point 
um, and then hopefully you don't have any disasters. <laughs> so I will, uh, I will stop sharing my screen now and I will let Max take over. Uh, and while he's doing that, I can, I can answer any questions for now. Thank you, Kevin. Is that all right? You did good. All right. I like the mustache too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I've, I've got my work cut out for me. Yeah, it's even better. <laughs> um, okay, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. and yes. Okay. Max, if you, if you wanna, yeah, I was gonna say to do that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to continue with, uh, I'm going to discuss the work I've done with Professor Dow in the past two and a half years, I think. My work is mostly, it's also fluid structure interaction, but I work with plates, they're clamped. Um, I will cover two experiments, the two works, the two first bullets, because I almost certainly won't have time for the third one. Uh, I will talk about plate model with in-plane boundary constraints, ranging from free to fixed, um, and the plate model in hypersonic flow with static deformation and aerodynamic heating. So, those are the titles, and so the first work, the, this is the up, the top view or a sketch of the theoretical model. We can see a massive rigid support on the outside. Uh, we assume that it is, it keeps constant temperature of T uh, support, and it's ideally rigid, and the, in the middle we have a rectangular plate with some distribution of temperature T some distribution of uh, static pressure differential. So this is a pressure load that is independent of the plate motion. Uh, in contrast to the incoming flow, Mach infinity, P infinity, and T infinity, that does respond to the plate's motion with uh, piston theory. We will keep it simple because our displacements are very small and the assumptions for piston theory hold even better than for a cantilever beam. So this is the top view. And the plate is clamped, meaning we have zero displacement and zero uh, slope at the edges, but this is in the terms of transverse displacement, DW. Now, let's see, this is the side view, cross-section in ZX plane, and um, we can see W is the transverse displacement, U is the in-plane displacement in X. There's a similar thing in V and the inside of the screen, displacement V. A static pressure distribution, uh, delta PS is depicted here. Uh, this is the one that does not depend on the plate motion. And the addition in our work uh, that is currently under review is the addition of this uh, distributed in-plane springs uh, across the edges. So here the K varies with Y. I could also draw a cross-section, perpendicular cross-section in ZY. Then I'll have KX. And how we vary them to be very stiff or very soft uh, substantially affects the dynamics of the problem, as I will show you. In, uh, in the results. Important to know that previous models, existing models, were always assuming some one of the extremes. It's either fixed in plane, the plate was ideally constrained in its movement, or it was completely free. It could slide in and out in plane. And so this basically covers the range of the possibilities. Now, how, how do we approach deriving this? Uh, uh, it's very similar to what Kevin does. We use uh, energy methods, Lagrange's equations, because it's very, uh, there's a very specific method, it's very uh, algorithmic almost. So we start with writing down the uh, elastic energy of the plate. So this is basically the thin shell elastic energy. It has bending, it has uh, tor torsion, stretching. This expression is very long, is in contrast to what you might see in the literature, because this is in terms of W, U and V and their derivatives. When you write it down in strains or stresses, it's very simple, it's three or four terms. But because we want to impose very specific in-plane constraints, we need to, to go through this uh, terrible thing, that is this expression. Now, the kinetic energy is much simpler, it's simply the velocity square integrated. Notice the integration is over uh, the, the plate surface. The z direction was integrated and it's simple because it's a thin shell, so the assumption is uniform in z. So there I have h, I have H defined in this D, and this mass it is basically rho density of the material times H. And our addition is the elastic energy due to distributed spring at the boundary. So these integrations are line integrations in the y and x direction. The 
for the corresponding edges and it multiplies the specific local displacement in u or v uh, respectively and so now we need to to make assumptions we do the usual assumption of uh, variable separation we expand w u and v in uh, terms of model shapes our problem is uh, in 2D, so I need my size, my uh, shapes, modes to be in X and Y. And the number of ex modes expanded in W, U will be are not dependent. I can choose different N, W, N, U, and N, V. An important point to, uh, to say here is that U and V could, in theory, move as a rigid body. It could translate to the right, translate to the left. It could also rotate as a rigid body. And all this must be accounted for when we make these assumptions about the shapes of motion. So that's why we have one very specific mode uh, coordinate, the rotation UR and VR, that must be equal because there's only one rotation. The problem is that rotation introduces displacement in U and V. So I'm just mentioning it here in the full paper it described. This has implications on the way we take the derivatives in the Lagrangian. That's why it's so important and makes the math instead of two pages, 20 pages. Um, so when we do the assumption of special shapes, we can go back to the definition of uh, elastic kinetic energies, take the integrals, get rid of the spatial uh, variables and remain only with time. The Wi's, the Ui's and uh, Vi's, the model coordinates. And so we have the Lagrangians, uh, kinetic energy minus elastic energy minus the new elastic energy that we have from the springs we introduced at the edges. And uh, important highlighted terms here, are uh, these in the second uh, parenthesis we have the thermal terms so um, thermal expansion or contraction due to thermal loads is very important as we will show it adds or uh, reduces the stiffness of the whole structure and the implant edges are quite simple those are quite simple terms they add almost no complexity to the whole problem as a whole it is another parameter for the model to consider because now if we want to model a physical model, we have to choose a K, choose its distribution. So that's a question that raises when modeling and correlating with experiments. Now we simply take the derivatives according to equations, to Lagrange's equations, and we come at this uh, uh, system. We have uh, four sets of um, equations. We have the W model coordinates, the transfers displacement. We have U and V. And we have the rotational, it has its own thing in 22D because it's, it couples to everything and it involves everyone. Um, and now when we have this system, we can, in principle, we can time arch this as a whole, but it's, it's a lot of coordinates to keep track of and it's not necessarily needed. Typical assumption done in shell theory is to neglect the in-plane inertia for U and V and which uh, reduces the 22 B, C, and D to simple algebraic equations. So I can arrange it all in a simple uh, linear system of equations, solve for U and V, the model coordinates, and then back substitute into 22 A, where it couples to U and V, and take these summations. I work in index notations, so these are summations. And uh, so, so that's in principle what we do. And we also add piston theory in this right hand side with Q which brings us to this very much simpler model. We have the inertia term that is unchanged. It's the simple linear uh, plate theory. We have piston theory, the damping term Kevin discussed, and the stiffness term. They are here in model coordinates. Uh, so they might look slightly different than what Kevin showed, but I go through the exact same steps. Um, I have structural stiffness, linear and nonlinear. This is the linear one. It sums with the aerodynamics. And it has G2 because it went through several steps. It has the implicit effects of the in-plane stress through U and V solution of the algebraic equations. So to get this G2 and K is a lot of work. Same for D2 and KRS, which is a third, this is a, a cubed nonlinearity in W. This is the static pressure differential. Uh, I, I showed it to you in the sketches. The important thing about this is that it is, does not multiply W coordinate. It is independent. It is prescribed. It could be. It could vary in time, but the point is this is external forcing. Hey, hey Max. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, your third order structural stiffness. 
um, that's different than mine, right? Because mine is based on large curvature and yours is based on the in-plane tension, right? Yes, yes. So this is uh, the from, more from the shell theory. Yeah. Okay. So even though they're both third order stiffnesses, the the matrices are going to be different, right? That that multiply them. Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure. Yes, yes. Okay. If our if our energy terms are different, then certainly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so important thing to note here, relating to what Kevin said. The nonlinear terms here become important when the displacement of the plate is in the order of one uh, of thickness and not length. So beam, when it deforms in the order of its length, that's considered a lot. For a plate, most of our plates are like within one millimeter thickness. Sometimes it's even 0.1 millimeter. So they are basically sheets of paper. And when its deformation is within this order of 0.1 or one millimeter, the nonlinear terms are very are dominant. Um, okay, so to show all of these dynamics and behaviors, we need to somehow solve this system. And we have two main approaches. From this point on, I will basically show you figures that would be computed using one or, or the other method. The first matter is to numerically time march the system. This, we prescribed initial conditions, the loadings and time varying if we want pressures. And then we have the panel's response in time in model coordinates, which I can easily translate through the expansion terms to physical displacement at a certain point. This supports time varying parameters, predicts, this could be used to predict time to flutter onset. Uh, let's say we know that flutter takes place in certain conditions, but the experiment in the wind tunnel can last only for 10 seconds because that's the type of wind tunnel. But our computation shows that it requires 100 seconds to reach the mid-cycle oscillation. So, so this is certainly ba bad design. We need, to, we need to change things to make at least theoretically possible to reach flutter in the wind tunnel. The other method is eigenvalue analysis. So what we do is this method, what it gives us, it is gives us the eigenvalues of the, the model eigenvalues and the mode shapes. Eigenvalues hold the information about natural frequencies and damping. Natural frequencies are the the frequencies of this specific mode and the dampings classify whether it's stable, unstable, and by how much. Um, this is a very fast computation. We can sc scan a lot of cases very quickly, draw stability maps, whatever we want. But uh, the complicated part is that, let's say our plate is initially deformed. Let's say we have static pressure differential. It, it's like putting a weight on it and we have deformation and the plate already has some added, uh, added stiffness because it's like pulling a string on a guitar and changing its uh, tune and just picking it once it's already uh, tense. So we, what happens that we have added stiffness effects. So our, the procedure in this computation is to linearize about a certain nonlinear state, uh, assume a harmonic uh, form of solution and solve for omega, um, and, or, and W hat, which are the mode shapes, and omega is the eigenvalue, which breaks down to natural frequency and the damping. Now, now I'll start with the computations and what we show in this paper that is currently under review. The first one has nothing to do, with, not so much with fluid structure interaction. This is a buckling, buckling problem of a flat plate. What we do is we increase temperature differential and we see when the plate loses stability. We look at the eigenvalues when some of them reaches um, uh, instability, the damping is positive, say. Then we classify this backhold and we draw a point. So the red line is the zero boundary displacement. This is the ideal model previously existing. It has uh, ideally fixed in plane edges and it buckles at 35 Kelvin approximately for every K. K has no meaning in this model. K here is the in plane stiffness that is assumed uniform all around, it is normalized and plotted in log 10. So this is a 35. Our model is in black, and as we increase the non dimensional k to thousands, let's say, it approaches the idealized model that existed previously. And as we reduce the in plane stiffness, we need more and more temperature differential to induce buckling until it reaches a, the very high value. 900 Kelvin, when, where your problems will be not the buckling, but the material properties deteriorating because of the temperature. So why does this happen? So imagine the ideal case of no resistance at the edges and you heat the plate up and it expands. 
there's nothing to resist this expansion. There's no reason for the plate to buckle. And so the, in the limit of uh, softening in plane stiffness, we see a very high temperature differential because there's no a high enough value to buckle the plate. Uh, in contrast to ideally fixed when any small expansion is resisted perfectly at the edges and we have a very low uh, temperature of buckling. So this is, this is the behavior of buckling in this model. Now a bit more complicated. Here uh, we, the x-axis is the static pressure differential, the amount of load loaded on the plate and it is sort of proportional to the deformation of the plate. The y-axis is how much the first natural mode's frequency varies. So we'd imagine that the more deformed the plate, the, it is more stiff and the natural frequency raise, rise. So the red lines here are the idealized model from previous literature. We have zero displacement and zero stress. Zero stress shows the very the least change in first natural frequency. It is the least uh, resisted uh, edge and it has the least reason to become stiffer at the in general. The other extreme is zero displacement, so it's fully resisted at the edges, and we see almost um, doubling in the first natural frequencies, which is a lot for, for a change, for a measure change. Our model is in black, uh, three values are shown here, 0.1, 1, and 100, uh, all non-dimensionalized, and they span the two extremes previously existing in the literature. Red crosses are also from previous experiments, you can see that they lied somewhere between the two limiting cases. And our model, when chosen a 0.5 value for the normalized K, uh, goes through these data points almost perfectly, which is very encouraging. Um, this computation is done by solving a nonlinear steady state problem and then using eigenvalue analysis. So this is a bit elaborate as a computation. Now for fluid structure interaction. Now we introduce piston theory and we vary lambda previously mentioned by Kevin as well. This is proportional to either static pressure different, uh, static pressure of the piston floor or the dynamic pressure, it could be transitioned. And what we measure is the amplitude of the limit cycle oscillation. So first of all, all models, the previous literature again in red and our model in black, lose stability at the same almost 900 lambda, which is encouraging because the linear part of the system, which is associated with the loss of stability in flutter, does not depend on the in-plane boundary conditions. So this consistency is very encouraging. And then we see that the zero displacement, the more constrained uh, limiting case, shows the smallest uh, limit cycle oscillation amplitude, while the most uh, free to move uh, it has the largest amplitude. And our model spans these cases. Um, okay, now final figure for this specific model. This figure combines both uh, effects. First, we deform the plate due to some delta p, and then we increase the speed of the flow uh, by using not the speed, the pressures, uh, and we check when does the plate loses flutter. And we put a point point in this figure and call it lambda f, lambda flutter. So let's look first at the experimental uh, results from previous literature. We see that as the plate deforms more and more due to delta p, it takes larger lambda for it to lose stability and flutter. Previous literature limiting cases uh, captured this behavior very well. These are the two limiting cases, the dashed red line and the continuous red line. And our model, the, the more recent computation, is agrees very well with the experiment and again spans the same behavior within a reasonable offset from um, previous values. So this is a complicated computation and very encouraging results. Um, and that's it for the varying in-plane boundary stiffness uh, work. Okay, uh, this is the second work we've done. It has been uh, recently published a few months ago. This is before we had the varying in-plane stiffness model. So here the assumption is that we use the limiting case of zero in-plane stress. The edges are perfectly free to move, but in this work it will be shown that it, is, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, this was done with uh, in collaboration with uh, our colleagues from University of Maryland. And the top sketch view here is identical. We have temperature differential, which will be important here. We have free stream flow on one side of the plate and stationary air on the other. And the plate is clamped. Now the experiment here is important. Uh, 
experiments were conducted in the NASA Langley 20 inch Mach 6 hypersonic wind tunnel by Thomas Whalen and, Whalen and Stuart Lawrence. They have a paper currently, the revision is currently under review, which focuses on the way they measure things and the aerodynamics of the problems. While well, our work is more on the structural, uh, fluid structure interaction model and theoretical model. So the left uh, sketch shows you the, the installation of the plate. The floor uh, is, is uh, parallel to the flow. It's incoming from the left. It reaches a ramp with a, with a varying ramp angle. And part of this ramp, the gray area, is the elastic plate. Oops, I'm sorry. The elastic plate. So again, the support is assumed rigid and massive, and the plate is thin. Uh, it's about 0.8 millimeters, and it's very elastic. So the rotation of the flow uh, creates an oblique shock of varying strength because of the varying ramp angle. And there's interaction of boundary layer interaction, um, shock wave, and the elastic plate. All, all of this is, uh, is measured using the optical markers grid and photogrammetry, several, an installation of several cameras that measure the whole uh, these, the motion of these trackers. And eventually they process these motions into transverse displacement and send this data to us. So what I get is uh, 0.5 seconds recordings at 30 kilohertz. So it is very high speed cameras and very short durations of the plate simply vibrating in response to this whole interaction. So these are free vibrations that hold the information of the whole fluid structure interaction. So to make sure that our following correlation is good, we first compared the natural frequencies of the plate outside of the wind tunnel. They conducted a model testing with a hammer, measured the natural frequencies, and they plotted it in a blue continuous line, the experiment. So the lowest natural frequencies of interest is 1000 hertz. The highest is 6000 hertz. This is about the 11th mode. Our model predicts the theory, the blue dashed line, which lies within 12% difference, which is which is not bad considering we reached the 11th mode with this difference. And there's also another theory shown here, which is basically a closed form for a rectangular plate, which agrees perfectly with our current model. So now we trust the linear part of the structural model and we can introduce aerodynamics and conduct uh, further correlations. Now we need to discuss the aerodynamics that we introduced to our model. Um, what we do is we take the simple piston theory and we assume an oblique shock of a prescribed um, ramp angle. So here I have, let's look at the left figure. Uh, theta varies from 10 to 35. Theta is the ramp angle in the experiment. And Mach number, the initial Mach number is six. It is not shown here. What is shown here is the Mach number after the oblique shock. So it drops to 4.5 and then goes to almost two. Uh, also shown P infinity, which raises with ramp angle because the compression oblique shock becomes stronger. So these are inputs to, in my calculations, in the aerodynamic model part. The right figure shows uh, temperature differential and static pressure differential. Static pressure differential was measured. They had a sensor uh, in the upper side of the plate, in the lower side of the plate. The lower side of the plate was assumed stationary fluid, while the upper is piston theory. And temperature differential was estimated. It is a very elaborate way how we estimated it because there was no measurement. Uh, you can, if you want, find it in the full paper. But in general, it goes from 40 Kelvin to 90 Kelvin uh, as a function of theta. And it is a very important part of this calculation because heating introduces expansion in the in plane and reduces stiffness and thus changing the natural frequencies. So an overview of what the experiment does. Experiment measure, measures free vibrations in response to these complicated systems using optical, mar using optical markers. This is processed and we obtain natural frequencies and mode shapes. The method uh, used is uh, SPOD, spectral proper orthogonal decomposition. In, uh, simultaneously, I do the theoretical computation using all these inputs. I showed you the linear, the structural model, which is nonlinear, but the linear structural models has been verified and the aerodynamics, which is piston theory with these parameters. And then I can compare the natural frequencies per each mode as they vary with ramp angle. So the first mode is actually the least impressive because the extracted from the experiment natural frequencies were very noisy because noise was approximately up to 1000 Hertz, which is which where the first natural mode lives. 
So here there are several curves. I will ask you to focus on the experiment curve and the full model curve to shorten this discussion. The experiment curve here has only three data points because of the noise. And the full model is the red line that uh, goes almost uh, the closest to the black line. The y-axis shows the normalized first natural frequencies. It is normalized by the out of the tunnel experimental value. So if outside of the tunnel we had within 12% difference, here we are within 10%, 15% which is encouraging because here the system is substantially more complicated. As we go to higher modes, this is the second mode, we see that we have more experimental data points and the full model uh, follows this trend within a reasonable offset of 15% with a very good agreement. The other curves show that other configurations of the model, for example, without temperature differential or without pressure differential, cannot follow this trend and show much larger, larger differences. Uh, in short, what is important, uh, mostly important here, is the temperature differential to get this part right. These are the third and fourth modes. Uh, again, interestingly, as we go up in the modes, the percentage difference actually reduces. The, first, the fourth mode at ramp angles of 30 to 35 is very agreeing very well. Part of this is being that at large ramp angles, the noise, the external noise that excites the plate is much, much larger. So it is easier to measure coherent natural frequencies and mode shapes. So these are the natural frequencies and these are the natural modes. Uh, this is the first mode. Uh, left is the experimental, which is slightly noisy. And the right is the theoretical, very good agreement. And this is the 2-2 two, two mode. You can also see the actual values of natural frequencies is uh, very close to each other. The 3-3 three, three mode, we are already at above 5,000 hertz, which is very impressive to reach with such agreement. And last figure, it's not a correlation with experiment, but it is on the same configuration. It's a more demonstrate a very important concept in this family of problems. This is a stability envelope in the plane of P infinity and delta T. P infinity and delta T are two parameters that by increasing them, you can induce a certain form of instability. So by hitting the plate, we go on the axis here and reach buckling at 100 Kelvin. If we walk on the y-axis, we increase the p-infinity of the free stream flow, we reach flutter here. Any combination of the two can, re cre can create some form of instability, either flutter or, or buckling. So concentrate on the red lines and the red text. This is the flat plate uh, stability envelope. We can see this sort of a looks like a rectangular, uh, sorry, it's like a triangle. And, uh, and this is the, the stability zone. Inside this is stable, here we have flutter, here we have buckling. If we initially deform the plate with some delta P, it was chosen 40, almost 45 kilopascal, uh, then we have to look at the black lines and the black letters. Buckling, increased, buckling temperature increases substantially from 100 to almost 250 and the region of buckling is here. And flutter is almost unchanged. It remains almost identical. The color map here shows the limit cycle oscillation amplitude of the region that, is, that lost, loses stability in form of flutter. So to, to calculate the envelope, all I need to do is eigenvalue analysis to scan all these different values, classify stable, unstable, and then draw a line. To calculate the color map, I have to conduct very expensive computations of limit cycle session because they have to be long enough to be convinced that the amplitude has converged. <clears throat> and so imagine if, if an experiment begins at a room conditions, we, we are here at zero and pressure starts to rise and the plate starts to heat up, we may enter the unstable mode. So we basically walk on this map as transient process takes place and we can classify when are we expecting to reach some form of instability. <clears throat> and well, we're done. So I will um, conclude. So what I and Kevin discussed, we discussed that we derive models using Lagrange's equations, energy methods. We prescribe uh, constraints, boundary conditions, or using this very powerful tool. We use several, two solution, main solution methods. We time arch our equations or we conduct an eigenvalue analysis with a possible expansion that we can linearize the, a, a nonlinear system and then conduct an eigenvalue analysis for, for a more powerful um, tool. And the boundary conditions matter. 
Uh, Kevin works with cantilever beams. Deflections are very large, has impact uh, on the aerodynamic model that, you, that is chosen. And clamped plates has very small deformations, but structurally very important. And so aerodynamic models can be simpler. And, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we can take any questions if there are any. <clears throat> we don't have a question slide. Yes, do we have some questions? Uh, this is Michael, I've got a question. Yeah. So do your high order methods give any indication of a lower bound of accuracy? Uh, the, the, upper bound, the upper bound kind of expansion is fantastic. Uh, but if you account better for these increased nonlinearities, are you able to see more how low you can go in Mach number before the model starts to, to break down in that direction? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. Piston theory is really for, yeah, Mach uh, like two and above, I'd say. Um, but yeah, I think you could you could probably push it to the lower limit and just see what you get um, and how that would relate to Euler results or experimental stuff. Um, I'm not entirely sure how accurate it would be, but that'd be an interesting uh, comparison to make. But yeah, we haven't we haven't done it yet, but that's a good question. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have a. A big picture question. You've done all this fantastic work, right? So if I'm the general in charge of the Air Force, why should I be interested in what you've done? Uh, that's another good question. Um, that's something that I had to I have to field kind of quite a bit at the Air Force. Why, why should I care? Um, you should care for a couple of reasons. One, because these these modeling approaches and these the philosophy behind this allows you to really dig into the math behind the code um, and behind these results. So you can see where the results are coming from. It's a really transparent way of modeling things rather than just a, a, a you know, commercial black box solver. Um, so that way your engineers actually know when they can trust the results, when they shouldn't, and what, what the results mean a little bit better. Um, which obviously gives you more insight into the final product. Um, but also, I mean, these, these methods are just, the, the modal methods are much faster and much more computationally efficient than something like a commercial finite element solver. Um, we saw for, even for the Euler simulation, I mean, that took days on the computer and the, you know, these modal simulations take a few minutes. Um, so, so there's a couple of different benefits, uh, one of them being the transparency of the model and the insight that they provide, another one being the computational efficiency. Okay. Ma Maxime, uh, oh, after, after you've done all these calculations and compared your results to the various experiments, are you, uh, are you thinking that comparison is what you would expect? Is it better or is it worse? Uh, how, how well should we expect to do with theoretical models when we compare with these hypersonic wind tunnel experiments? Um, I think the correlation is, is impressively good. I mean, considering at the core of it, the computations are not that complicated. I mean, if I compare to how complicated is a CFD solver or a finite element, and then I look at what I have in my scripts and um, the math I use, it is impressive what is possible to do by simply time marching all the E's. And the, our, in our more recent work, we do transient responses that show transitions between a stable plate goes unstable and then stable again. And capturing these transitions with this, the same model is, is, is encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. There was a famous physicist named Eugene Wigner who once wrote a paper and the title of it was something like The Unreasonable Success of Mathematics in Describing Physical Phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe I'll write that down. <laughs> who, who was that? Uh, Vickner. Vickner. Are there any other questions, Michael? Uh, you're in charge, right? Uh, yes, I suppose I am. Uh, anyone else in the class, if you have other questions, uh, please, please feel free to email them to us. Uh, this recording will go up onto the course webpage uh, along with the rest of the lecture recordings. Um, thank you for those who, who have attended. Uh, we understand that today was optional and you have uh, many, other, many other stresses at the end of the semester that you're worrying about. Uh, I'm glad that you could join us today. Uh, I'll be presenting next Tuesday. Again, that's an optional lecture on some reduced order modeling. It's, it's a similar approach. Uh, we're using spectral methods, and but we're looking at full full order uh, fluid solutions instead of um, uh, a simpler a simpler fluid model like um, like piston theory. However, we won't be looking at much structural dynamics, so a compromise there. Uh, and then next Thursday, we also have our own uh, Dr. Jeff Thomas, who's going to be giving a presentation. So. We hope to see you next week. Thank you for those who have signed up already for, um, for a slot for the uh, final exam next week. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, everyone. Sure.